Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome, all of you uh, present here at Dalhousie University. And uh, to those of you that are viewing uh, this event via live stream, uh, welcome. My name is Brian Noble, and I'm the convener of this event, and I'm very honored to, to be able to uh, work with a group of really quite amazing presenters this evening. Before proceeding, I, I wish to honor, uh, first of all, the indigenous peoples uh, from whose territories we are presenting this evening. Um, and then I'll ask Dr. Sherry Picto, uh, whose Mi'kmaq name is Mo'in, uh, and who comes from Ilsakuk, Bear River First Nation, uh, to offer a welcome to the territory. So specifically, uh, Dalhousie University is located in, in Mi'kmaq, uh, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is also uh, treaty territory, and all of us have obligations under a series of still living peace and friendship treaties that were signed between the Mi'kmaq and the Crown in the 1700s, and which are in force to this day. It's for this reason that we also uh, say, quite often we are all treaty people, um, that meaning all of us, the, the Mi'kmaq, indigenous peoples in the territory, settler peoples and other newcomers, uh, territorial visitors. We all come under the, the treaty. So our intent in gathering uh, in support is in support of fulfilling the spirit of those treaties tonight. Okay. Um, so Sherry, could I ask you to uh, come forward and, and uh, offer a welcome? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. It is with great honor as a Mi'kmaq Unu woman that I welcome each and every one of you uh, to Shabakto, the Halifax Dartmouth area within my ancestral lands of Mi'kmaq, which extend to what is known today as Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, to parts of Quebec and Maine in the USA. It is with further great honor to welcome Dr. Jeremy Schmidt, the keynote speaker for this evening, and Russell Dowell, Mohawk policy analyst and land defender, to this important and timely event. I say timely because Dr. Schmidt's important research that resulted in a paper, Bureaucratic Territory, First Nations Private Property and Turkey Colonialism in Canada, comes at a time when we are facing Canada's new Indigenous rights framework. And as Jeremy's research points out, and Russell Dowell's critical analyses has been informing us for a while now, including throughout the early idle no more years, Canada has been expanding its paternal colonial practice under the guise of what Indigenous, uh, non-Indigenous, and now some non-Indigenous politicians refer to as closing the gap. You cannot close the gap within the parameters of a neoliberal colonialism that caused the gap to begin with. Not too long ago, my own ability to recognize allies was called into question. And I think I have enough experience to know now when we have an ally. And Jeremy, you are an ally. And Russ, you are truly a truth warrior. We will hear tonight some critical truths, like Russell Diabo always contends, we need truth before reconciliation. To put it another way, we must ask ourselves, what are we reconciling to? And with this, I wish to also thank Dr. Brian Noble of Dalhousie University, another true ally, for organizing this critical space to discuss these truths. Russ and I know all too well how difficult it is to speak truth against powerful forces that will do anything to silence or circumvent those truths. So in closing, I call on you as we hear these truths, let's also think, think about the ever-increasing numbers of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, the suicide epidemics um, among our youth, and the unacceptable levels of poverty that Indigenous children face every day across Canada. Let's also think about the Indigenous women and their allies on the front lines defending our sources of food and water from, 
from Alton Gas, the Sisson Line, the Mustard Falls, across Canada to the Trans, uh, Canada, the Trans Pipeline in BC, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. And I also want to acknowledge that some of those women who are on those front lines who couldn't be here tonight are offering prayers and ceremony for this gathering on your behalf, Jeremy and Russ. It is only through accepting these truths and the ones you hear this evening that we can move forward in building true reciprocity and how we and future generations can live together on Turtle Island sustainably. With this, I again welcome and thank you, Dr. Jeremy Sherman, Shannon, and Russell Dialbo for making this moment of truth happen. This is no about all my relations. Amazing! Thank you so much for that welcome and for really, you know, doing a lot of my work in introducing and uh, and putting uh, Jeremy and Russ into the context of of these long histories and uh, this moment that we find our in today, ourselves in today. Um, as you saw in the images cycling on the screen, the title of the keynote talk is "Bureaucratic Territory: First Nations Private Property and Turnkey Colonialism in Canada." And giving the, the keynote is, is Jeremy Schmidt, who in 2014, um, Dr. Jeremy Schmidt, who in 2014 and 15 held the prestigious Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council Banting Postdoctoral Fellowship here at Dalhousie. And that's the, the most prestigious fellowship for a postdoctoral uh, individual uh, in Canada's social science system. Jeremy is the author of the recent and very brilliant book, Water, Abundance, Scarcity, and Security in the Age of Humanity. And based on the exceptional quality of his cumulative doctoral and postdoctoral achievements, including a Trudeau doctoral fellowship and a postdoctoral stay at Harvard's anthropology department, Jeremy uh, went on to receive the council's highest honor in 2015, the Shirk Impact Talent Award. Um, and I should point out that Jeremy currently uh, is a, uh, lectures at Durham University in the United Kingdom at one of the leading geography schools. Jer Jeremy trained in geography, but does this beautiful crossing into anthropology and, of course, now very much engaging with indigenous people's uh, situations in the colonial context we find ourselves in today. Um, allow me to read you what the, one of the sponsors of this event is, is the Social Sciences Humanities and Research Council um, through the Impact Talent Award. And I'm going to read to you um, uh, what the Sh what Shirk says about these words. First of all, the impact awards are designed to build on and sustain Canada's research-based knowledge culture in all research areas of the social sciences and humanities. The talent award recognizes outstanding achievement by an individual who in a given year holds a Shirk doctoral or postdoctoral fellowship or scholarship, the Banting Fellowship being one of these. This is the premier award that is given in Canada to any doctoral or, or postdoctoral uh, candidate. It's given to an individual who maintains academic excellence, has a talent for research and knowledge mobilization, and has demonstrated clear potential to be a future leader within and or outside the academic sector. Part of the expectations of the Impact Award recipients and the institutions that host them is that we bring and share the impact of the recipient's scholarship and achievement with the wider world, specifically demonstrating and increasing its impact. And that's what we're doing tonight. We're fulfilling that obligation. Um, with support also for tonight's event from SHIRT, we have support from the Dalhousie Office of the Vice President of Research and the Dean of the Faculty of Graduate Studies. The, in 2015, November 2015, I joined the Vice President of Research and the Dean of, of uh, Graduate Studies to go to the event when Jeremy received the award. And it was uh, given by the president of the Social Science and Humanities Research uh, Council, Dr. Hewitt. Um, tonight, we are honored to have Jeremy here to share the fruits of, of all of these awards in his talk. Jeremy's work, uh, based in potent Government of Canada and Government of Alberta Freedom of Information searches, is providing us with exceptional insights on the way that government policy on the privatization of First Nations lands has been advancing both publicly and more importantly beneath the radar. So this is a moment of how research begins to expose 
that which is going on, the undercurrents of government and the way that policy may be developing in ways that we aren't engaged with. So a very important contribution. The impact of the research is particularly far-reaching, and its findings have garnered interest from a number of First Nations and from the rights and justice-seeking indigenous active, activist movement, Idle No More. Uh, tonight, we're also deeply honored to have two absolutely outstanding indigenous respondents, Mr. Russell Daibo, who's Mohawk from, from Ganawagi, and Dr. Sherry Picto, who gave us the greeting, who is Mi Mi'kmaq from Elsa Bear River First Nation. They're going to offer additional insights uh, after Jeremy has, has given his lecture, uh, responding to uh, what he is presenting. Uh, they'll offer comments, context from their perspective, li of likewise seeking just relations with the Canadian state, fulfillment of treaty obligations, and the wider, stronger advancing of the self-determination of their peoples and all Indigenous peoples in their unceded territories. And through their unsurrendered sovereignty, the territories on which Canada has been built, in fact. So I'll provide more uh, detail on their background the, when they're invited to offer their responses. <laughs> Lastly, you will have noticed that this event also honors from the slides uh, the life contributions of one of the most highly respected, high impact, and important spokespeople for Indigenous peoples, land rights, and self determination really in the world, not just in Canada, not just in his own Sequatomic territory, but internationally. And that's the Sequatomic activist and leader, Arthur Mandel. Uh, both Russ and Sherry and I all knew Arthur well. He passed away quite suddenly and unexpectedly in 2017. Um, but he actually had well, then at, posthumously released a second book and had just released one book. His first book, Unsettling Canada, is uh, you've seen on the slide, had, was an has had an enormous impact on bringing Indigenous peoples' title, rights, self-determination, uh, positions, and the struggles they've been through into the public sphere in a, in a really powerful way. His second book, The Reconciliation Manifesto, uh, takes us into the international regimes. It takes us into the, the United Nations Covenant on, on, not the United Nations Covenants on Human Rights. It speaks to all of the dynamic of struggles that Indigenous peoples have been facing uh, throughout Canada's colonial history through to the present. Um, I urge you to, to buy those books, read those books. Um, I was very honoured, have very honoured for about 15 years to work very closely with, with Arthur Manuel. Um, when he passed away, we were in the midst of completing a report called the Sequatmuk Territorial Authority Report where we worked with land defenders, we worked with chiefs, we worked with, with women who are who are land-based uh, gathering women who have great power and were, were working very closely with us on trying to understand how Sequatmuk Territor Territorial Authority actually operated in a source of law, as a source of law, as a source of governance, and how to respond to the ongoing brutal history of colonialism in Canada. And we brought together a group of leading academics, including two leading scholars who were involved in the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, um, um, Dr. Michael Ash and Dr. Kent McNeil, both of whom are major figures uh, nationally in Canada. Later on, we had Professor James Tully from the University of Victoria, who was also involved in the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. One of the things that Arthur Manuel always saw was that he welcomed non-Indigenous settler people into his territory, and he also very strongly saw the importance of scholarship, of scholars. And what he found out when he began working with us is that the research we have been doing, the findings that we have been gathering, the, the analysis of the law and the histories actually coincided and reflected all that their experience had been. And so he welcomed us, and and I mentioned this to, uh, to Russ, uh, that uh, Jeremy had produced this, this really important paper. And uh, much like, like Arthur, as Arthur would say to me, you know, you academics, you know, you're telling us stuff we already know, but the difference is they're going to listen to you, and they aren't listening to us. So you're going to bring verification and extra power to that, and you're also going to bring the depth of scholarship that actually shows that what we've been saying all along is absolutely true. So 
in that sense, I want to honor Art Emanuel. Uh, I think he's, as much as Russ, uh, uh, one of the great truth campaigners that, uh, that helps sort of set the stage for where we are in our current, current moment. All right. So with that, I'd like to uh, welcome Jeremy to the podium to uh, deliver the talk on bureaucratic territory. Thank you for the very powerful welcome and uh, for the very kind words, Brian, for putting this together. Uh, I look forward to uh, a chance to talk directly with Sherry and with Russ after the talk and with anybody else who is interested. And one of the things that I'll start out by saying, well, I'll start with two, uh, two notes. The first is that what I'll talk about today is based on uh, access to information requests that I've gathered from the Canadian government. Those access to information files, I'll, I'm happy to make freely available to anybody. So if you happen to want to wade through thousands of pages of bureaucratic documents, they're there, they're there for you to take. Or if you would like a particular part of them, I'm happy to cut out those parts and send them to you. Similarly, with the, um, with the paper that I published, there's some copies down here just in front of Janice. So if anybody wants a copy of the, of the paper itself, it's there as well uh, for you to have. Otherwise, I'll just dive right in. Um, since 2006, shortly after coming to power, the Conservative Government of Canada, under Prime Minister Stephen Harper, started to develop what's known as the First Nation Property Ownership Initiative. This initiative was carried on into the early stages of the Trudeau, Trudeau government. What I'll present today is based on analysis primarily from 2010 to 2016, in the spring of 2016. So roughly six months after the Trudeau government came to power. What happens after that point, I don't have um, documentation for. But there are some uh, important arguments that I think we need to consider for why we should pay attention to what happens in that time. Because even though the legislation uh, that I'll, I'll talk about that comes into draft form by that time uh, hasn't been passed and may never be passed, certain other aspects that facilitate this sort of legislation are already in, in place and they are already having effects. So there are important reasons to look now at what's happened. You know? And so I'll just begin with where the inspiration for these, this uh, program to convert lands reserved for First Nations into private property came from. This sort of uh, idea has been long-standing in Canada, but the recent iteration took inspiration from the work of Hernando de Soto, who has been uh, very influential globally, particularly in policies with the World Bank that have been pursued in Latin America. The argument of Hernando de Soto when it comes to land and title argue that creating private property for indigenous people is a way to guarantee cultural security because indigenous people in many colonial or post-colonial contexts lack rights to land. The argument is that if we give private property rights to land, that will function as a form of, uh, of security, primarily by taking what indigenous people have, converting it into private property, allows for what he calls the conversion of dead assets, so things that people have but which they can't use in the global market, to be converted into assets with economic life. Meaning that if you own private property, you can get credit against that private property, such as through a mortgage and so forth. If you don't have certainty of title, the argument goes, you don't have that kind of economic life, so you're inhibited from participation in the global economy. In 2010, Hernando de Soto was invited to Canada by the First Nations Tax Commission, and, uh, which is headed by Manny Jules in British Columbia, to give a presentation on why this would be good for Canada, and why the Indian Act of the 19th century should be revised to allow for private property to be held on the lands uh, reserved for First Nations. Bureaucrats from Ottawa flew out to the conference in Vancouver and they reported back on the ideas of Fernando de Soto. Manny Jules and others came at that time for, a, for testimony on what turned out to be a failed bit of legislation to similarly make the case that the goal for converting 
lands reserved for First Nations into private property, would do precisely this, would take debt assets and convert them into those with economic life. In 2010, the government went public with this idea, which it had been pursuing for some time by then. They'd already spent over a million dollars presenting, uh, developing the proposal in its initial stages. And in response to this announcement, the Assembly of First Nations issued a resolution and sent notice to John Duncan, then the Minister of Indi uh, Indigenous Affairs, or they called that at the time, but I'll just use that since that file changes almost daily. Um, Anyway, the Assembly of First Nations issued a response to say that they reject this idea. They reject the proposal because it runs counter to the distinct responsibilities that, and obligations that they have to their territories. This refusal of indigenous, of by indigenous uh, people is something that I want to pay close attention to because what I'm going to argue today is that what, the, what happens within the bureaucracy reflects the kinds of refusals and the kinds of objections that they see. And so, for instance, in, in, so what I do here is I, I track in this paper the bureaucratic process. I track that through the emails that I can read, through the charts and reports and the drafts that I have access to, and which you could have access to if you wish. Um, for instance, in response to this letter, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs issued a statement that was interpreted by the bureaucrats to suggest that what the minister wanted was for this proposal to not be interpreted as government policy, but to be interpreted as an indigenous-led initiative. And the idea of having it be interpreted as an indigenous-led initiative was to, quote, lowball consultation. That is, to start pursuing a policy that would not trigger the legal duty to consult indigenous people on law or legislation that may affect them. So here is one example, and I'll draw on others, where the, a refusal comes and there's a response within the government of how to work around that refusal while still pursuing the same policy agenda. And this happens at various points. The core argument, and I'll go through this bit of relatively quickly, but it's, it's important. The core argument behind the book, I'm sorry, behind the proposal, comes from this book called Beyond the Indian Act. And the argument of this book is that Canada's Indian Act is premised on the historical misrepresentation about Aboriginal property rights. Namely, the, the book claims that Aboriginal property rights weren't recognized at the moment of settlement when colonists arrived, and because they were recognized, now it's the duty of the government to restore them. This is the argument of the book. So restoring these, these rights then will be a means to collective economic freedom, or economic freedom and collective security. And the book was written by uh, Tom Flanagan, who many of you will recognize the name as an erstwhile strategist for the conservative government before it had a very public falling out, which happened to be on the same day I first presented this research, which completely derailed the talk because it was just turned into a gossip session. So the second author was... Uh, Christopher Alcantara, who's a political science professor at the University of Western Ontario, and Andre Ledrisse, who's the director of fiscal realities, with, uh, fiscal, yeah, sorry, fiscal realities, which is an investment uh, corporation designed to help enable fis uh, investments into First Nations. The foreword was from Manny Jewels. And the reason that I point this out is this is a case where a book is published that is taken up very seriously by government, not by coincidence, but one in which the government references that reporters can be referred to that is cited in ministerial briefs, and which becomes very influential in understanding what this proposal is going to be about. So this book is one that becomes quite influential. Although it's not taken up as the authors precisely intend, it nevertheless shapes things considerably. And it shapes them considerably in two important ways that I want to come back to later, but which I'll introduce now. The first is that it sets up a, a relationship between collective territory and private property. And it argues that in the formation of nation states, collective territory of communities became, identif became identified with the political space that is necessary for social or group survival. And so territory becomes a collective claim. And within that collective claim, communities set up, some communities set up states. And they claim jurisdiction or authority over that space or over that territory. 
On the other hand, individuals in those spaces can get private property. And so private property functions as, in this, in this argument, is not one that I agree with, one that is especially correct. Private property becomes consolidated in the idea that individuals own things, and they buy them and sell them. Or they use them however they wish, or they transfer them, which is the, the three sort of main rights around ownership, the right to use these things as you wish, the right to dispose of them or sell them or transfer, and the right to exclude others, the right to have boundaries around your private property. And these two core ideas drive um, the fundamental argument of the book, and they're particularly important. And I won't go into all of the details so that I can get into more of what happens, but the main consideration is that Private property is not, in fact, some natural notion of ownership. In fact, ownership is only one part of private property. In law, private property is understood as a social institution that protects both owners and non-owners through a whole series of regulations. So, for instance, private property owners are subject to laws around zoning, around taxation. There can be liens or mortgages put against property. There can be other issues of distribution, such as environmental rights and protections. And this is this entire social institution of property that is understood when we talk about private property, not just ownership. And so consolidating things, consolidating property only in ownership isn't really sufficient for, um, for proposals such as this because it assumes that the social institutions of indigenous people, as they're affected by the Indian Act, wouldn't still be in place if we just created private property, when in fact the Indian Act affects indigenous lives in total. So this is a, an important piece to keep in mind why this theoretical argument has significant problems. Nonetheless, in 2012, the Harper government came to majority power. <clears throat> And they started to pursue this agenda with, a more, with more vigor. They announce and are reported on largely in the national media as pursuing the private property agenda on reserve. Here are just a few uh, articles from the Globe and Mail, excerpts from the book that I just referenced, ran in the National Post, and so on. These are all things you could Google and, and take a look at for yourself. A key component of how the initial phases of this private property agenda start is in the omnibus budget bill C45 that was passed in 2012. Many of us will remember that this budget bill sparked the I Don't Know More movement and galvanized a cross-section of indigenous peoples and environmentalists as a result of its changes to water laws as one instance. It also made a small, a subtle, but a very important change to voting laws in, on, on reserves for indigenous Namely, it changed the requirement for voting on how land or on land um, policies operated on reserve from one where the requirement was 50% of all members agreeing to a change to one where it was 50% of those who vote on a particular uh, measure. And this had a very significant change because, and this is very similar to the rest of Canada, our democratic system sometimes operates with a very low voter turnout. But things that pass by more than 50% of even that low voter turnout are considered legitimate, right? which is one of the reasons why we try to increase voter turnout. Now, Tom Flanagan, writing in defense of this change to the voting laws and against Idle No More in the article at the bottom of the, that you can see on the screen, argued that this change to voting laws simply makes it easier for First Nations to lease land. Then he argued at the bottom, and I think giving away a little bit too much of the conservative government strategy, said that the duty to consult is a shibboleth of our time. That is, the thing that has to be said just right for, it, for something to be accepted. The shibboleth being an old uh, Hebrew word that you had to be able to pronounce just correctly. So, as I've already, there's two problems with the account that I'll go through quickly. One I've already mentioned. First is that ownership alone doesn't sufficiently supply the content for property. The second is that the idea of territory used by the Canadian state is a cultural, not a universal concept. The notion of state territory, in fact, has a long history that is tied to 
forms of law and politics that emerge from Europe that are not a natural outcome of group competition, which is the account that is given by, by Tom Flanagan and others. And so, because that concept of territory is not just a natural evolutionary outcome, the attempt to make it so is an attempt to get around the very important acts of violence and racism and structural discrimination that, have, that attended the settlement of Canada and the United States and other settler colonies, such as Australia. So those are the theoretical problems, and these are important because, as I mentioned, this book was influential in shaping policy ideas. So these theoretical problems aren't just ones that academics should be concerned about, they're the ones that shape the way that bureaucrats set about this task of developing policy. So we need to counter the theory that they themselves are using, not just to sound smart, but to help influence policy on the inside, hopefully by giving our own refusal yet again. A second part of the proposal as it came into development was that as bureaucrats looked across Canada at the many reserves and all of the different types of land regulation policies on them, such as leases or certi certificates of possession and so on, they began to realize that for any private property agenda to succeed, it would have to be able to, uh, it would have to be able to apply it nationwide in a system that was not deterred by circumstance. That is, a system that we could apply uniformly. And they started to talk about this kind of uniform system as having a turnkey design. That is, by putting your key in the lock and turning it, we would change everything that was before and introduce a new system. And so, as the private property proposal took shape, the turnkey design was referenced frequently in this in standing committee uh, testimony by both the authors of the book and others. And it was ultimately settled on that by turning this sort of key, if, if, in, if this proposal went forward, all 43 land administration pieces in the Indian Act would be put aside and private property would become the sole way to govern that particular bit of reserved land. The second component that the the turnkey design asked for was who should turn the key. The government, again, was very keen not to trigger the duty to consult, and as part of that, set up the legislation in terms of in what they termed an opt-in form of legislation. That is, no Indigenous First Nation would be required to make these changes, but they could opt in to this formula once it was passed in law, it, it, should it ever be passed in law. And of course, the mechanism for opting in was through a vote. So as I've already said, the voting change took place, and that creates a different set of conditions for opting in. So just to recap quickly before we go into the more uh, nitty gritty, in 2010 there is a refusal, or there's a resolution against the First Nations Property Ownership Initiative. The outcome of that refusal is, is threefold. Bureaucrats quickly work to lowball consultation in their terms. They designate the entire set of legislation as a First Nations-led initiative, one that's not the government pursuing it, but is being pursued, on paper at least, by First Nations. And here, the primary actor is the First Nations Tax Commission, which received several million dollars over the course of these policy proposals to, to develop them. Finally, the opt-in or turnkey legislation, as I've just described. Now, if you're a good bureaucrat, the first thing you need to do is put things in a table to explain things to your peers. This is bureaucrat lesson number one. And so here is a table that I won't go through in particular, but which you can, we can go through in detail, that shows how the First Nations Property Ownership Initiative differs from other land management arrangements on reserve, particularly in the second column. So the FNPO is the First Nations Private Ownership Initiative on the left-hand side. The second one is the First Nations Land Management Act, which is uh, widely being pursued uh, at this moment in time as one of the more recent acts of legislation. And then a series of self-government uh, types of arrangements from the Nishka, the Seychelles, and the Tsuasen. And what's a, a particular note when we're analyzing these sorts of documents is what gets into a chart and what gets out of a chart. 
how a chart is organized, because how these charts are organized is an action of bureaucracies that becomes a technology for governance. So charts aren't neutral things. Charts are a way of organizing thoughts, ways of comparing, and ways of telling us what to compare. So I put this here, not necessarily to go through it, but to give you a sense of the sorts of things that I'm looking for in a paper like this to say, what are the ways of governing that we can analyze to see what's happening? So, all of this takes place underneath the conservative government, but in 2015, as we all know, they lose. The federal election in the fall brings the liberal government to majority power with our current prime minister, Justin Trudeau, in the leadership of the country. At that time, there was also, and it's not the first time, of course, but there was a housing crisis in Attawakaskat, and the Senate Standing Committee sent a message to uh, various arms of the bureaucracy asking for ideas for how to solve the housing crisis on reserve. And at this point, the bureaucrats have roughly 10 years of momentum building around this private property initiative, and they see an opportunity to suggest this. If there's a housing crisis, one way to fix it is to create private property on reserve because then individuals can get a mortgage for, to make renovations, to buy a new boiler, to get a new heating system, whatever it might be. And so they float this idea as a potential solution to the housing crisis, to which they receive this message. The minister is not here. A sound, sharp rebuke. This is not a good idea. And so the bureaucrats step back and they reposition the initiative. And what I'll concentrate on the, in the, the remainder of the talk is how bureaucrats take this policy that forms under the conservative government and they reposition it in terms and in a framework conducive to the new liberal government, such that the same policy, the same ideas, are now packaged in new ways, such as in terms of reconciliation, even in terms of stopping the threat of dispossession. So how did they do this? Well, first, they began to pay very close attention to the signals that the government was putting out. That is, in, in letters to the ministry that the prime minister said, sends out, also in speeches, particularly speeches by the justice minister. You remember that the, uh, the campaign was a Sunny Ways campaign, so this is my tongue-in-cheek title for the slide. The justice minister made it one particular speech that bureaucrats latched on. And she argued that three core concerns were going to guide the renewal of state and indigenous relationships that was promised by the Trudeau government. Remember, that was one of their key promises and their platform for the election. The other was to abide by the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And the Justice Minister emphasized these three core pillars. Jurisdiction, enhanced jurisdiction for indigenous peoples, enhanced control, and enhanced choice. And these three pillars become the new anchors around which the private property agenda subsequently pivots. And it does this in three reports that I can email if you'd like to see. The first comes out in, well, the draft that I'm citing here, comes out in March 2006, or 2016, and is called a blueprint to enhance First Nations jurisdiction and control over reserve land. And in this report, the, art, the, the authors of the report make the case that private property is the means through which to enhance jurisdiction. It is the means through which to enhance control over uh, for indigenous people over their reserved lands. I can go into more detail precisely in the arguments uh, later on in the question time, but for, for now I think I'll just give you this, a sense of how this, this operates. The second key report is under, is called Understanding the Reserve Gaps on Indian Act Reserve Lands. Sorry, Understanding Regulatory Gaps on Indian Act Reserve Lands. And this report becomes particularly important because when should a private property initiative be put in place, it will trigger a whole set of other sorts of regulatory changes that are required. For instance, provincial and federal arrangements around things like environmental protection or building codes or... Uh, for health. And as, the, as this document is prepared, one bureaucrat wrote to another to say that he was quite certain this might be the most comprehensive 
uh, analysis of the gap between what happens on reserve versus what happens off reserve ever undertaken. So this became a, a, key, a key point of, of the uh, agenda for the private property initiative because it helped lay the groundwork for what sorts of regulatory changes might need to attend changes to land tenure. And in particular, it started to make these comparisons between what was happening on reserve currently versus what was happening off reserve primarily in cities, in urban contexts. So urban contexts get introduced here as a way to, as a way to start understanding what kinds of gaps we should be looking for. So we're not comparing, for instance, Indigenous First Nations land to the gap between the Alberta government or the Ontario government or Quebec or the federal government. And we're comparing reserve lands to cities. So that, so that becomes the gap that functions to, as a sort of regulatory framework in which, uh, that we might need to identify. The third is the First Nations Property Ownership Initiative Summary and Analysis. And this document is the result of a small technical discussion group that had been meeting every two months since 2012 to develop draft clauses for what legislation to privatize reserve land might look like. What sorts of changes to environmental laws, for instance, or surveying requirements to go from existing land tenure systems to new lines of private property. All the sorts of technical issues that would be need to work out in legislation was handled by this small committee, again, with the First Nations Tax Commission involved, as well as Natural Resources Canada, and several surveyors and other experts in land title and registry systems. In the First Nations Property Ownership Initiative, this means the, uh, well, just one, one last thing. So all of these together were part of what was understood at that time as being restorative. That is the overarching framework as this bureaucrat wrote, and I'm not identifying the bureaucrats by name because it's not part of what I'm out to do. I'm just trying to show representatively of some of the things that were going on. This bureaucrat wrote, our overarching theme or objective in the development of our lands reform work has been how we can provide First Nations with greater jurisdiction and control over their lands. This becomes the driving ethos. And in fact, bureaucrats interpreted what they were doing as busting myths. So what was the myth that they thought they were busting? The myth they thought they were busting was that when Canada was settled, property was not recognized at all. And so Canada had been built on a myth that Indigenous people never had private property. But now we will bust that myth and we will show that and we will restore private property. And they have a myth-busting document that they circulated in-house to introduce colleagues to the file, people who are new to what was going on. Much of the, the work on this file was also uh, declared a cabinet confidence underneath the Harper government, so much of it wasn't uh, available for scrutiny by access to information requests, such as the ones that I requested. And much of it also wasn't available because a significant part of the communication on the file was, as one bureaucrat said to another, meant to be done in secret. And so they would pass USB keys from one to another rather than using the standard channels of government, which is either email or some other written form. So this is largely what is happening. In that document with the draft clauses and so on, very carefully placed in a box called analogy is an analogy, appropriately. And in that analogy, to explain the entire First Nations Property Ownership Act, the, the idea was that it's sometimes easier to understand the FNPO proposal by understanding how property rights are managed off-reserve. Canadian municipalities have the right to manage lands within their jurisdiction using local land laws, taxations, zoning, and bylaws. No matter the nationality of the property owner, the property is subject to the zoning and land laws of the municipality. And so here, the municipal, the municipal comparison starts being used to, again, rescale claims from territory that were initially part of the, the core bit of the, the book that was used in this legislation, faultily I, I, I critiqued, nevertheless still about territory, now being a claim about municipalities. So the idea under, underlying this, I argue, is that there is an attempt to convert reserved lands into something like a new form of federal municipalities in Canada. 
what would those municipalities look like? Once all the regulation and dust is settled, will it enhance choice and jurisdiction and control as is promised? These are, in the draft um, proposal, the fixed versus the flexible regulatory changes underneath the FNPO. The fixed regulations outnumber the flexible ones, roughly two to one, and the fixed regulations are some very important pieces of regulation. For instance, property law itself will function as, it, as the government determines that it's fixed, so will land titles, so will voting, so will things around uh, expropriation, so will environmental protection, so will rights around timber, sand, stone, and gravel. Very big, important items will be fixed. So there won't be any control over those particular items. What a First Nation would get uh, in terms of flexible regulations would be things like zoning and land use, building regulation, development, fire protection, and so on. All very important items as well, but certainly nothing like a transfer of territorial control or jurisdiction. It would be a very limited set of uh, regulations that, that would be flexible under the, underneath this proposal. So what I've been looking at since this time, so this is a 2016, is to try to understand the ways in which multiple changes have already taken place, even though this particular legislation hasn't been introduced to Parliament and may never be introduced to Parliament. Nevertheless, a series of important shifts have taken place. Okay. Changes to voting laws new understandings of the ways that the duty to consult is not pursued or skirted at, at different times. Also important is to understand the more lo the long-standing critiques around the municipalization of First Nations, which has been uh, something that stretches all the way back to the late 19th century, and also to get a sense of what is happening within bureaucracies themselves. That is, how are they responding to refusals in ways that shape regulatory agendas? In this case, the turnkey design of this legislation affects multiple Indigenous claims to land, to laws, and to regulations regarding land. First of all, the FNPO, as it's described in these documents, will require that First Nations who opt in will need to opt in with all of their land. That is, a reserve, reserve land, you couldn't just create half of it to be private property and leave the other half in some, some other form of tenure, such as a commons or some other collective form of title. All of the a reserve land would have to be uh, converted. And this is designed, again, to create a uniform system across Canada. Right? So that there would be a turnkey design, everybody would know exactly what is going to be converted into what, and there wouldn't be, and with the fixed regulations I just described, this would all take place. The second is that all of the previous land administration regulations within the Indian Act would be put to the side. And along with putting these to the side, we have to think about the important effects that all of those land regulations have had in other ways, particularly because the Indian Act has structured kin relationships, has structured access to land, has structured different forms of passing land on to different members of family, to new people, depending on the way that the Indian Act also affects membership and so on. So wiping it clean all of these other land administration um, regulations also has the effect of putting aside various serious political and often legal struggles or contests that might be going on around existing land management on reserve. All of those would be wiped clean. And so I'll just stop here so we can go into discussion because every academic talk has to end with a quote. Here's the one that I chose, which is from Blaise Pascal. Blaise Pascal writing on the law, writing against the rationalist René Descartes, wrote that we must not see the fact of usurpation. Law was once introduced without reason and has become reasonable. We must regard it as authoritative, eternal, and conceal its origin. That is, we have to have a myth about it, right? If we don't want it for it, for, if we don't want it to soon come to an end. So what, I, what I'm, my goal is with this sort of talk is to expose the origin and to expose the initial act of these sorts of legal changes so we don't have to put them to an end later because they don't get off the ground. So thank you very much. Right, thank you so much, uh, Jeremy. That was really rich and... Uh,
and I think it's going to lead to some interesting uh, uh, discussions. So, the the way we'd like to proceed uh, to generate some discussion with Jeremy on this paper is, I'd actually like to ask both Russ Seibel and Sherry Pickford to come to the front to the to the table. And first of all, I'm going to uh, give Russ uh, 10 to 15 minutes to. Uh, to respond to the paper or as much time as you need within that, and then to turn it back to Jeremy so the two of them can have a dialogue for a little bit about, about what Russ's understanding and recontextualizing of, uh, of what Jeremy has presented is. And then we'll, then we'll do the same thing with, uh, with Dr. Picto and, uh, and give her some time as well to have a dialogue with, with Jeremy. So, uh, Russ Saibo, I just wanted to just point out in terms, by way of introduction, um, is is a very very important national figure in right struggle for Indigenous peoples in Canada. He's Kanawagi Mohawk. He's a leading Indigenous rights policy analyst, editor, and publisher of the First Nations Strategic Bulletin. Uh, some of you may know he ran this past summer in 2018 for national chief of the Assembly of First Nations on the Truth Campaign, which took on the very fact of this new rights and reconciliation framework and other policies that have been writing beneath the surface but which, which are not necessarily getting enough public play. Um, and he's pointed to these things as colonizing practices that are aimed at Indigenous rights termination uh, and he's been a central force in grassroots Indigenous land struggles since the 1970s. So I'll let Russ respond to it. Thank you. Um, first of all, I want to thank, um, the, acknowledge the Mi'kmaq people, the Mi'kmaq territory that we're on. Uh, I don't get out here too much. Um, I want to say hi to my friend Kevin Christmas, who I don't get to see too much. Way back there. And um, Kevin and I have been through many, many battles in the old days. We're a lot grayer these days than we used to be. But. Um, I'm sure he's very familiar with a lot of the stuff that uh, Jeremy has pointed out. It's always good to see um, evidence and validation of what we're talking about because, uh, you know, a lot of the chiefs try to say that we're uh, conspiracy theorists and, uh, you know, we don't, uh, it's not true. The government isn't the, the way we think it is in terms of its intentions. But, I think what Jeremy is pointing out, see, I, I myself go back, I've been around for a while, and I, I would go back to 1990, um, you know, um, and not just to Oka, but around that time, um, the Moroni government had a chief's committee on governance. I don't know if you remember that, uh, Sherry, there was a chief's committee on governance, and they were proposing sectoral legislation. and. Um, and um, they had things like the Chartered Land Act, which became the First Nations Land Management Act, which you had on your table. Uh, the government's been looking at different ways to, to eliminate reserves for a while. And um, to get rid of, uh, you know, Indian, uh, Indian people as, as uh, distinct peoples. So what I see... Um, in the research that you brought forward is uh, basically through the, um, the Harper decade, the dark decade as they call it, um, you know, the, the techniques that they've been trying to do from previous decades. And, um, you know, what I would see is uh, it's carrying over with the Trudeau government because uh, in a lot of ways they, they haven't changed, they've changed the, the rhetoric <coughs> and uh, you know the style but they're using the same policies and approaches um, you know they're still after the same objectives and I would say this indigenous rights recognition framework is is the culmination of that so what I would say is um, when the Trudeau government ran in its 2015 campaign it made a number of promises that sounded really good to indigenous peoples and to the Canadian public. They sounded very progressive in the indigenous policy. They're going to recognize nation to nation uh, relationship. Uh, it's going to be reconciliation. Um, 
They're going to have a law and policy review to decolonize uh, Canada's laws. They're going to have a murdered missing women inquiry. Um, they're going to, um, you know, come up with a new. They're going to remove the cap, you know, on spending the two percent cap that the Paul Martin had put in in 1995 under Cretchen, a liberal cap uh, on programs and services. So they made all these big promises, and they all sounded good. But what a lot of the people didn't realize is when they make when a party makes a promise, um, it has its own interpretation of what those mean. And that led to a lot of confusion amongst our people in the Canadian public because they thought, well, that all sounds really good, especially after 10 years of hard work. But what they did was they manipulated those terms, including treaties and the inherent right that was all manipulated uh, by liberal interpretations, liberal government interpretations of those terms. And um, nation to nation turned out to be where they were going to have top-down non-transparent approaches with the national indigenous uh, organizations, like the uh, Inuit Tepper's out of Canada, like the Métis National Council, and like the Assembly of First Nations. So with the Assembly of First Nations for status Indians, what they did was they um, signed two memorandums of understanding, two agreements, one in 2016 on creating a new fiscal relationship, <coughs> and one in 2017 on shared their joint priorities, and they had eight areas including uh, under the joint priorities policing, uh, also to implement the UN Declaration, uh, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls to action, uh, this law and policy review. Um, basically, and they also said they were creating a bilateral mechanism, which is a fancy way of saying uh, an AFN cabinet committee to incorporate AFN into the federal decision-making process. Um, so for any, uh, for for the national chief now to say, oh, this, uh, this recognition act is not part of his, is really misleading because AFN has been part and parcel jointly developing um, the liberal agenda right from, for the past three years. And they've been bypassing our people in this top-down approach uh, doing that. Uh, some more examples are, you know, in, in uh, 2017, in June of 2017, the government, uh, the Minister of Justice unilaterally issued 10 principles, which I say are racist and colonial, because um, if you unpack them, they're based on the Doctrine of Discovery, they're based on the Constitution Act of 1867, where the federal and provincial governments are, are the dominant governments and we're going to be subordinate to whatever they come up with. Uh, it's based on interpreting Section 35 over the past 30 years of jurisprudence, which we have no say in. And, um, really works against us because the burden of proof is on us to prove if we, you know, if we assert we have Aboriginal treaty rights, we have to prove it when we don't have the money. It costs millions of dollars to collect the cultural and historical information to meet the legal tests the Supreme Court's laid out to prove Aboriginal title or treaty rights or Aboriginal rights. And um, so they, they put these ten principles out. And they say that's what's going to form the basis of it's a, 10 principles on relationships with indigenous peoples, First Nations, Inuit, and Maiden. And although they're saying one of the principles is uh, that it's going to be a distinctions based approach, they now want to pass um, a recognition act for First Nations, Inuit, and Maiden, like one law for all. And, um, you know, so they're saying one thing but doing another. The other thing they did was they, um, after issuing those 10 principles on indigenous relationships, um, they, in July of last year, they said, okay, we're dissolving the Department of Indian Affairs. And um, they said, we're going to create two new departments, one for indigenous services and one for crown indigenous relationships. They said in northern development, but they just did a cabinet shuffle and took northern development away, so Bennett's only the crown, Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. And um, they pointed to the, when they did it, the Prime Minister pointed to the Royal Commission of Aboriginal Peoples and said it was recommended by that report, so we're following that. But the first recommendation in the Royal Commission of Aboriginal Peoples report from 1996, and I was around then, um, was that the governments need to stop relying on the doctrine of discovery and fair and alias. The governments and the courts. 
So they're completely ignoring that recommendation and just cherry picking what they want to support their agenda. And um, because they're manipulating the terminology, they're able to uh, to convince people that <clears throat> their intent is, is good, uh, benevolent. And so that's all part of this framework. These ten principles, these uh, two new departments, and really. From what I can see, the Department of Indigenous Services is really taking over Canada's on-reserve responsibilities for delivering programs and services on reserve. So I call that the Department of Colonization. And Bennett is the Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations. I see her as addressing Section 35, the Aboriginal Tree Rights, implementing their unilateral policy of self-government land claims, uh, their negotiating positions with preconditions in them. Uh, to try and get new agreements. They have existing agreements like the James Bay Agreement, the Nishka Agreement, Kawasan, those are the so-called modern treaties. They want to get more. And the South Government Agreements are trying to do the same thing. And uh, so really the Indigenous Services Department is only interim until they can move the, the Indian Act bans, which are considered non-governing bodies because they're under the Indian Act. So you won't be a federally recognized indigenous government unless you sign a self-government agreement, a modern treaty, or some legislative arrangement like the Anishinaabek Education Act, which passed last December. In just a few weeks, the ground <coughs> went through pretty fast. So using their liberal majority in, in Parliament, they can they can put through laws pretty quickly when they decide to, because they also dominate the committee, so they can also choose who's going to appear before the House of Commons Committee on the Standing Committee on Indigenous Affairs. Uh, we saw them actually uh, a couple weeks ago on the Trans Mountain. They had a meeting of the uh, Standing Committee on Indigenous Affairs, and both the Conservative and NDP members tried to get a study going um, on looking into what happened with that court decision. And the Liberal majority voted it down right away. So that gives you an indication of what's going to happen um, with this Indigenous Rights Framework when it's introduced into Parliament. So they've completely bypassed their people for three years. Now they're coming up with this, uh, just last week, um, there was a national, the Assembly of First Nations had a national forum on First Nations rights. And the minister came there uh, with her uh, senior associate deputy minister, Joe Wild. They released an overview document which contains in it, uh, and it's available online, uh, in that overview document, that's the clearest indication so far of what's likely to be included in this rights recognition framework legislation. And in there, they're, uh, they're saying, and again, this is uh, for First Nations, uh, Métis, and Inuit. They're going to have a one-window uh, one concept there. They're going to have, they want an advisory committee set up to determine who could be recognized as an indigenous government or collective whatever that is, and um, it's going to require research in that, so again, the burden of proof is on those that claim that they want to be recognized as an indigenous nation or collective, and um, then they also said that uh, the governments created under that will have authority with the powers of a natural person, which really means a corporation. Jeremy, Jeremy and I were talking about it, and he says he thinks it, it could be modeled on based on his research, this municipal corporation model, because corporations are, I mean, municipalities are viewed very much as a corporation. And um, the Prime Minister has said uh, in June uh, 2016, he said uh, on tape, uh, we have him on video at a conference organized by The Economist where he said, there's the federal government, premiers, and municipalities, and after them is a fourth level. Of indigenous governments form the fourth level of government in Canada. So he's saying it's a fourth level. And now if you look at this overview document that they just released last week, they're saying that these indigenous governments, um, which have to be federally recognized, so they're weaponizing recognition. Federal recognition is weaponized because they're going to decide it. It's going to be a list of definitions, federal definitions, to guide the interpretation of what are Indigenous rights and how they're implemented. They're going to have these advisory committees that you have to pass the test to see if you're going to be recognized as an Indigenous nation or collective. Even if you do, your governments are basically going to be like these federal corporations that will be created. 
and there'll be a list of powers that they'll they'll pass in the legislation, and they can amend the list of powers, so they're controlling that. And anything touching provincial areas of jurisdiction, you have to have an agreement with them. So though they're saying to indigenous peoples, oh, free prayer and informed consent doesn't mean veto. The provinces are getting a veto in anything that touches their areas of jurisdiction under Section 92 powers. So that means if you want to talk about off-reserve territory, like Micmac territory, you know, you got to get an agreement with the province of Nova Scotia or New Brunswick or PEI or Newfoundland. Um, same with the Mohawks with Quebec or the Algonquins with Quebec and Ontario and on and on, right? He's looking at me to see how high I'm going to jump. Here. <laughs> so, so anything that touches, and that's why even things like child welfare, you need the, the provincial government's uh, agreement. They have a veto, basically, if you don't have provincial standards in your First Nations yes. child and family services uh, agreements. And the feds control the money, so this is where this new fiscal uh, approach uh, comes in, this new policy that they're going to create. They want... Um, to force own source revenue collection under these indigenous governments, which would include taxation, which means giving, getting rid of the uh, tax exemption that exists under the Indian Act. And um, basically they're saying you're going to exercise self-government or self-determination, because they're defining this as self-determination, um, because they're implementing the UN Declaration, they're saying in this legislation, um, you're going to exercise that on reserve. So the reserves are gone, you know, it's just pretty simple. But I would point out that, you know, a lot of these ideas can go right back to the 1969 White Paper uh, uh, Indian policy because they do say in the White Paper that um, moving reserve lands um, to private property would take several transitory steps. And when the First Nations Land Management Act was passed to create land registries on reserve, I thought, well, that's one of the first steps is to register individual interests get out of the Indian Act, because you opt out of those sections of the Indian Act into this First Nations Land Management Act. But eventually, once you have that land registry set up, it can be merged with the land titling systems of each province, so that you're then registering individual private property rights, because that is their objective. And if you look at the modern treaties, like Nishka and Tawasin, they had to agree to privatize their reserve rights, their, you know, uh, to be private property. And uh, the Algonquins of Ontario, which I know because I work for you know, several Algonquin governments, um, in the Algonquins of Ontario case, the only status Indian Algonquin community is Pickwaknagon, about an hour east of Ottawa, I mean west of Ottawa. And they have nine satellite groups that are non-status groups uh, who are recognized as Algonquins in those negotiations, but according to our research, haven't intermarried with Algonquins in two to three hundred years but they're being defined as Algonquins in order to be able to vote to extinguish title to the Ottawa Valley. Uh, they want a separate self-government agreement with Pickwaknagon, and in that agreement they want them to agree to accept their reserve as fee simple lands, private property, and to agree to give up their tax exemption and do open source revenue collection. So this research that uh, Jeremy has laid out here, I see the Trudeau government continuing through, through, through different methods to the First Nations Land Management Act, the additions of reserve policy, the land claims policies, and their self-government policies. And now they want to wrap that up in a nice bowl with this uh, federal legislation. So I want to thank Jeremy for providing the evidence and the validation for these things that I've been talking about for a long time. Uh, it's good to see the uh, academic community, you know, documenting and substantiating this stuff because our people need to know this because. They need to make choices. The government's forcing them to make decisions, and they should be informed. That's what I always say is, free prior informed consent is the informed part. You need to be informed before you can make a decision, which is why I'm the one that came up with the hashtag, I don't know more, K-N-O-W, <laughs> you know. And I guess I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Jeremy. So I'll just pick up a, a couple of points from the very rich comments that Russ just offered. The first is the, the reference that he made to the idea of natural persons. The, the notion uh, that the government is working with in the documents that I have access to is that uh, is their interpretation of um, 
municipal acts in Ontario and in Alberta that grant municipalities the powers of a natural person, by which they mean the powers to do such things as entering into contracts, to taking on debt, to extending public utilities, to contracts to smaller communities, for instance. You know, Edmonton has a big water uh, delivery system. Rather than a small community developing its own, it can contract with Edmonton's utility to provide it. Those sorts of examples are what the government means by natural person. But it carries significant legal shifts also because, for, because the government is keen to reposition this new agenda not as a sort of new form of delegated authority. The government is very keen to not be seen as delegating authority to First Nations because that implies that there's not a nation-to-nation -nation relationship. So the rhetoric needs to be that this is some sort of reconciliation, so the government can't just be delegating. And under the municipal acts in Ontario and Alberta, as interpreted in these documents, those communities who incorporate as natural persons don't have delegated authority. Rather, they enjoy new spheres of jurisdiction through which they can follow federal or provincial laws as they see fit. So it's not a prescriptive authority, it's a new form of authority gained on a new sphere of jurisdiction. So this, tramp, this move to a natural person accomplishes two goals at once. It accomplishes the jurisdictional component of the government, of the government rhetoric and it, in, and it accomplishes the choice component, that is, they don't have to prescriptively follow particular laws, they can enter into contracts to follow laws as they see fit, provided they don't run counter to the law, of course. So, um, I'll, I'll leave it there, because I, the, the other comment I want to make is about the new language of regulatory gaps, but I think that Sherry also wants to speak to that, so I think I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Yeah, just one point of information I forgot to mention, and Jeremy just reminded me of it. The other thing that's in that overview document is they're saying these indigenous governments will form a new order of government in the Canadian Federation. So that, that fits. Sorry. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, well, uh, I have all kinds of things to say. I don't know if I can back it up with the historical facts that Russ does. I know when, uh, even as an academic myself, I'm always running to him or inbox him on Facebook. Well, Russ, what's this? And he'll always, he'll always set me straight, you know, about things. Um, I think you partially a answered this, Jeremy, but um, the focus here is like on how the government is working to behind the scenes to turn reserve lands into municipalities. And I was wondering, um, I'll come back to this, but I was wondering about this whole notion, like what, you know, being involved in a little bit of politics myself or being around the chief tables and so forth, there's always this, getting to these regulatory gaps, is that, oh, we can't, you, because you're on reserve land, you have nothing to put up for collateral. And I'm wondering, you know, there's this municipality uh, dimension, but how much of that's really connected so that the, um, to um, encourage indigenous people to enter into these, these neoliberal development, you know, um, projects. And with that being said, and just to sort of come back to it, the, the other thing that, um, I, I just find it so ironic that, you know, I know that my community was one of the first communities as, as established as a reserve in Nova Scotia in 1801. And, to push us all onto reserves, and now the urgency of trying to turn that into private property. Or, you know, or when we were considered uh, non-voting people, and now to bring this notion of natural persons, but of course we know that's sort of from the corporate thing. And um, I just wanted to add just a couple of thoughts. Thoughts is that what scared me, like when, what happened here in 1999 when we won this <coughs> court case based on the 1760-61 treaties. There was a tripartite process happening here. And immediately as soon as we won that court case to, to a moderate livelihood to fishery, they took natural resources, not just fishing, but natural resources, right out of that tripartite and put it under the consultation. And so I've seen the same thing, and I think I wrote a, I wrote a policy brief on Yellowhead there's some critical analysis of some of the stuff on the, on the Yellowhead Institute. Uh, when I see this separation of the um, 
indigenous affairs into these two conglomerates, one crown relations and one services. I, you're seeing the poverty, you're seeing women, you're seeing all these issues pushed to the side and the crown relations, as we well know, is talking about property. What concerns me here is from the way that I've been brought up by grandmothers and so forth, is this interrelationship we have with the land and water. And this just seems to be a deliberate attempt to separate those and re like to not only dispossess us, but to dispel to dispossess our relationship with those land and waters. And, and that's what truly scares me, and particularly when it comes to women, because indigenous women, because we've been living with this patriarchal, heteropatriarchal Indian act for so long that you don't see women around the tables. You don't see that. And what's scaring me is that if we do not address this, and particularly with how um, with this private property, we know that women's going to even be further dispossessed from that. We're the only species, I think, in Canada that our identity and who we are it cuts off at 1951. We are the only people that has that discriminatory um, legislation in the Indian Act, and you know, though they tried to tweak it, it's still a cut off of 1951. And what really scares me is that, based on what I'm hearing, is that in, it won't be me, but will it be my daughter, will it be my granddaughter, and by then it won't be um, uh, five to six times, you know, uh, compared to other women that women get murdered or there's violence and all these uh, horrible um, things that happen to them. It'll probably be tripled by that. And that's just a perspective that I want to that that gender-based analysis needs to come into this and it just drives me crazy because um, we're not hearing enough of that. And um, anyways, I'm, I'm just kind of preaching preaching here at that point, but I have to get that through, but it's just really scary for me and I know, um, I don't want to betray Brian wherever he is, uh, but um, I, I do know that uh, when the election had happened, um, the um, question was proposed to our friend Arthur Manuel, like who should win the election, and he basically said Harper. And the reason why he said that was because the conservative government, they, they tell it, they tell him what, the, you know, we were talking about this earlier, Russ and I, and uh, they don't hide anything. And the difficulty with this government, it's so manipulative, and it is like the, you know, the termination in, 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 in you know, uh, reconciliation clothing, if I can use that. <laughs> but those are just I, my I, I say they're rebranding termination as reconciliation. Yes, yes, yeah. So, anyway, so, uh, and I just go on that. I, I, there's more research that needs to be done. This link between dispossession and and and, and missing Indigenous women. Yeah, yeah should be able to pick up on the yeah. first the first point and then yeah. the middle one that you raised. Yeah. The first one, the first point that was raised was about. Can you speak louder a little bit? Yeah, sure. It's mine. <laughs> I was on mute. My apologies. I'm sorry. Is that better? I'm sorry about that. So I'll just pick up on the first, the first set of comments, and then some of the comments that came later in a really nice way that Sherry draw their attention to the broader social context and political context in which private property functions in these proposals within an Indian Act that is oppressive on multiple fronts, particularly on gender. Right? This has been an especially important part of the scholarship by many powerful Indigenous women that I think uh, deserves to be front and center in how, the, how a response would be built to any sort of critique that we, we might agree to. Uh, so the, the first point that Sherry raised it had to do with how do these private property um, proposals fit with economics. Right? And one of, the, one of the key parts to this proposal, like others, is the rationale that there are a whole series of assets held on or held in reserved land that are, no, are not of substantial value enough to the global economy because they can't be because there's not certainty of title, there's not enough investment going into those lands. So, for instance, particularly 
Lamont Facade, major urban centers in Toronto, Calgary, Vancouver, would have very high real estate values if they were private property. So the argument is that those assets are dead, and by converting them into private property, they can come to economic life. That is, they can become part of the global economy. And that's what really drove the Harper uh, era's rationale for these sorts of things, taking inspiration, as I mentioned, from Hernando de Soto. The, the concern around this sort of policy from the government's perspective is to not look like they're privatizing lands for sell-off. This, this is in response to uh, American policy in the early 20th century, 1934, called the Dawes Act. And in the Dawes Act in the United States, there was private property created out of Native American lands, and that, that land was allowed to exchange hands in what a lot of people just call it a sort of free market form of colonialism, which took place as uh, Native Americans bought and sold that land with non-Indigenous people. And so eventually, the con contiguity or the coherence of one block of land was lost, and, the, and many communities uh, lost the sort of collective in integrity to a land base that they had previously enjoyed. The Conservative government and the Liberal government are both very keen to avoid this, because they are very keen to avoid the appearance of this sort of uh, free market colonization, as they call it. And so, that's part of, in, in the Harper era, in the book that I identified from Tom Flanagan, the idea that was initially proposed was that the government would transfer what they, what Flanagan called reversionary title, or radical title. That is, the sort of title to land that comes into play when private property falls out of ownership, but there's no heir to it, or there's no other claim to that land. To whom does that land revert? In current Canadian law, it reverts to the crown, either vested in the province or in the federal government, depending on a particular parcel of land. So if the proposal was to vest those reversionary rights, I'll just keep using their term, those reversionary rights in the First Nation themselves, so that the collective title to territory could never be lost. As their proposal went through the government, the, the bureaucrats and many other people in different uh, departments found that to be uh, unworkable, because it would create little pockets inside of Canada that weren't, that, in which the land didn't revert to the territory of the state, but reverted to the territory of indigenous people. And that is part of the reason that the municipal analogy starts to be taken up. In a municipality, you can buy or sell lands in London or Vancouver or, you know, any global marketplace, it doesn't matter where you live, that land still is called Vancouver. That land still is called Toronto. It doesn't matter the nationality of the owner in those cases, except for in some cases like New Zealand, where they you know, external ownership of land. So the, munici the municipal metaphor functions to get around this problem. It keeps ultimate title with the crown, and, but it gives a form of political space enjoyed by municipalities, which are, uh, if we called them territories, they would be territories in name only. Right? No one would refer to Vancouver as a territory. It's not how we think about territory or political space, it's how we think about cities. And so this analogy becomes quite important as a way for the state to inter to take indigenous claims and to convert them into a language and a set of laws that fit with its structure of governance. And then to extend that structure of governance as the overall framework for the available options for First Nations, such as the type that Russ is identifying, we expect to see an upcoming rights and recognition framework in this autumn. Right? And so some of the sort of regulatory pieces that I've identified and that, uh, that we've been talking about, those are pieces already in play, and other sorts of ways of framing within that framework, a gap between this place and that place, all works within a structure designed for dispossession. So in this case, regulatory gaps become a tool through which dispossession can proceed. It doesn't guarantee that regula regulatory gaps are, are dispossessive in every single case, but it becomes a tool within the repertoire of the state for that to proceed. So with that, we'll, we can open it to additional questions or comments. Yeah, um, I, I will. Thank you all very much for that. Um, uh, we will open it up to questions. I just, I just wanted to ask one myself that, that has been which I think is kind of the elephant in the room in this, and, and I think Sherry was getting at it uh, in her comments about the separation of the uh, Department of Affairs of the two divisions, which then separates out 
the concerns that are more addressed to the situation of women from the concerns as addressed to the situation of land. And so it affects a, a separation of women from the land where they, in fact, in their livelihoods, they have a deep connected relation already. Um, and it seems to me that, that maybe each of you can, can respond to this, that every time these kinds of proposals come forward, they're introducing all of these incredible cleavages and breakages, uh, new categories which, which First Nations, First Peoples who, who live on the land and have had long histories of living on land in particular ways have to constantly reshape themselves too. And, it's, and from the way that, that Russ has, uh, you know, I've been spending the last day with Russ in a number of conversations about the perpetual replacement of one kind of land management proposal uh, from the from the crown, from the state, uh, by another and another and another, and this constant frenetic having to move to it. And what happens? I mean, how do how do how do indigenous peoples uh, bring sustain their own sense of land relation that's not coming from the state, but it's coming from them as a uh, as, a, as a, to use uh, Jeremy's word as a refusal or an answering back. Yeah, I, um, well, it's a loaded question, but I'll just uh, briefly respond. Uh, it's just from experience, and uh, I just want to acknowledge with some land defenders in the room, women, really tough women, um, which is so ironic when you look at um, all the um, Who's in, in the front on the front lines trying to defend lands and waters from development? It's, it's it's women, and the strange irony in that is that I and I, I'm just starting to explore this, and I I thought about this, it's, and I mean I mean they're putting their lives on the line, and I'm thinking now why is that? Why is that? And in a strange way, I'm not saying this in a general way that applies to everything, but in, uh, I, I'm wondering if there's something in where women have been so marginalized and the irony and the sad irony of being marginalized is that they have kept their connections with the land and they know what's at stake. So having said that, I wrote down quickly this book that I wish had been available when I was doing my thesis. Was, um, it's called Indigenous Encounter with Neoliberalism place women and the environment in Canada and Mexico. And she does a comparative analysis of what is happening, of how um, movements like through uh, um, Chiapas in Mexico compared to one of the, I, I think it might be the Nishka Agreement, one of those agreements. And it's starkly different. It's really starkly different uh, with the, those approaches of trying to uh, protect the lands and so forth, and the women's involvement in that. Um, I had another thought, but I just lost it to the end of the day here, but um, maybe I'll come back to it, but I'll pass this on. Well, it doesn't surprise me that uh, women are at the, the forefront on uh, being land defenders and water protectors, because uh, it's the women that have always looked after families and the children and um, you know it's a myth I think the Indian Act uh, it is patriarchal it, it was designed to be social engineering I mean section 12 1 B was to encourage uh, Indian men to marry white women and you know raise the children in the mother's language and uh, culture and to, and to strip the status of women you know and say you have no status you can't live on reserve that was done deliberately and it's because, um, you know, culturally, historically, our women um, really ran the communities. Uh, as a Haudenosaunee, a Mohawk man, I know. <laughs> the women are the ones that, that uh, were the ones that controlled the land, the longhouses, the clans. When you married, uh, you married into the wife's clan. You followed the wife's family. And the women are the clan mothers are the ones that are involved in choosing who the chiefs are. And we have war chiefs and peace chiefs within our Haudenosaunee, uh, our, our uh, traditional houses. 
and it's because they know the children have which temperament to be which kind of chief. Um, and uh, that's true from what I've seen in other, amongst other indigenous nations too. The women play a big, big role. And um, again, it's because they're usually the ones that have the knowledge of, oh, you can't go out with her because she's related to you. <laughs> you know? They know the genealogy, and they know, uh, and they, they know the division of labor between the men and the women. So women know uh, which plants are good for medicine and, and on and on. So it goes back to our indigenous cultural and territorial landscapes, which are beyond the reserves. You know, I was talking to you about that, uh, Brian and uh, Jeremy, about how, you know, it's one thing to look at the reserves, but really those are kind of like base camps. Uh, we were kind of forced there, depending on how the reserve was created. You kind of have to look at, okay, how was the reserve created? Because there's so many situations across the country, like in Quebec, there's seven different kinds of reserves, depending on which instrument created them. So you have to look at what was going on with the people before the reserve was created. You know, the pre, pre-reserve or pre-Indian Act communities and nations. And, and you have to look at the post-reserve like how were they treated by the crown after the reserve was created. But people were still using their traditional territories and getting in conflict with the law, with the provinces. You know, the first court cases in Canada in the 1960s were over hunting and fishing cases, long before Marshall. And, and that's where that Indian Eskimo Association... We got one 1927. So. Yeah. <laughs> But but the 1960s is when the Indian Eskimo Association created the first law book, the Native Rights in Canada book, that law schools were starting to use across the country. That you know, yeah, they do have rights. You know, and that was just the beginning of you know scratching the surface. Um, and a lot of those cases had to do with the men going out hunting, but uh, a lot of it involved our women too. And um, what I what I've said is, you know, I think. In order to exercise self-determination and fight this termination plan that, that the federal government has, because you know you call it different policies and that, but I just see it as a constant termination plan. It's just different techniques that different governments come in, and it's because of bureaucrats, as Jeremy points out, bureaucrats are really the permanent government because they prepare a red book, a briefing book, and a blue briefing book depending on who wins the election. You know, who makes which promises, the bureaucrats have said, oh, we promise this, so let's see how can we implement that if they get in. And so that's all they keep doing, is shifting the chairs around on the Titanic and saying, okay, this is how we're going to convince the Indians to go this way. And it's usually tied to money. Yeah, I mean, Trudeau has come up with $17 billion over seven years since he came in, last three budgets, totaling about $17 billion. But if you look at that $17 billion, the bulk of that is for on-reserve programs and services. It's not for off-reserve. And, but, you know, a lot of the chiefs are happy with that, and they're quiet. Because, you know, I said it during my campaign for national chief. I said, you know, uh, that $17 billion buys a lot of uh, consent because it's basically paying for all the band office staff, the advisors, the lawyers, the organizations, right up to AFN. They all have jobs, so they can keep arguing about what's what our rights are or what they aren't. Meanwhile, it's our people who are you know are being used as the fodder, you know, who are left out and not getting proper services, you know, that are, are left behind. Which is why I said for the past three years the Trudeau government's rhetoric, because I, I view his rhetoric, is bypassing the people. But it's all convincing the people that your life's going to be better because you know we're we're getting we're reducing those boil water advisories and. We're going to put more money into education. We're putting money into child welfare. You know, meanwhile, uh, it was just pointed out that Trudeau hasn't delivered on the 2.8 billion in education dollars yet. You know, so he keeps saying in this carrot up, and then he's saying, "Well, after the next election, we're going to deliver on it." Because that's what he did. Was he, he made these promises? He back ended a lot of that money until after the next federal election. So it's all going to be dependent on whether they get in or not, and whether after they get in, if it's going to remain a priority or if they're going to shift to something else, probably depending on what happens with the NAFTA talks. You know, because if those go down, then there's going to be trade issues, because it's going to be about the economy. 
And he keeps telling us, he told us right from the beginning, his priority is the middle class. Even though he keeps saying indigenous peoples are his most important uh, relationship, he's saying his priority is the middle class, and that's what he's going to look after. And we're going to be marginalized on that. And it's going to be our leaders that are going to have to, if it's the conservatives that come in, they'll be chasing them like they did to Harper. You know? And that's why I think we have to. Uh, we have to build our own strengths on the ground and stop relying on political parties that come and go and do our own plans um, and uh, enforce them. Because if we don't get access to lands and resources, to me it's the land, that's what Arthur always said, right? It's the land. But otherwise you're going to always be dependent on federal payments. If you don't develop your own uh, access to lands and resources, which means fighting with the provinces, because that's the one thing you don't hear Trudeau talking about, is he never said, when he says he's going to implement the UN Declaration, he never talks about Article 26 about restoration of lands, territories, and resources. Article 27 talking about jointly setting up a body to, to resolve those land rights, because we've never had a say in the land claims policies. And then the third thing is restitution. If you're not going to restore lands, then there needs to be restitution or compensation. He never, and that's Article 27. He never talks about because he doesn't want to talk about having to take on the provinces. Instead, we get this uh, overview document where this legislation says, okay, anything to do with the provinces, you've got to get an agreement. So, our people aren't even aware of that. That's why I'm with a coalition of indigenous activist networks, where we want to educate and, and get the information out to the people. This is a threat to, uh, because if this law passes, it's not only going to affect this generation, but future generations. And if we don't stop it, uh, it's going to be them that are going to suffer. Because what this legislation does, as I said, it says it's going to create a new order of government. That means they're going to sever our historic relationship to the land, to our treaties, because we have them in Quebec too, 1760 treaties. Um, it's going to sever all that and have a new relationship where we're going to be this fourth level government behind municipalities at the bottom of Confederation. Not, not in the position we should have. So first thing I want to do is make sure uh, our people are aware of this, get the information to them, the evidence, you know, of what's going on, and then to mobilize them. Even if we have to do a caravan to Ottawa or whatever we have to do, we have to move and shut this down. Because they want to introduce this law before Christmas. So we don't have a lot of time to stop it, but stop it, we must. Anyways, that's just my talk. I'll say one thing that in the, in, the, in the discussion about using municipalities and municipalization to govern indigenous peoples in ways that would be similar to what's going on off reserve, the elephant in the room that Brian brought up is, is probably one of the best examples. Right? The, the distinction and the difference between service delivery versus political representation is precisely how the rest of Canada is already organized when it comes to municipalities. That is, it's not supposed to matter who you vote for to be mayor. You're still, your taps are still supposed to be turned on in the morning. Right? And this has a long history that goes well back into early colonialism and was piloted in cities like Manchester, where things like street lighting and public utilities were introduced as a way to rule cities through new forms of liberalism that were being experimented with in the Industrial Revolution. And they were tried out and tested in other places like uh, Calcutta, in Mumbai, the colonialism has a long history of doing this, making exactly this sort of division, dividing the technical services for urban uh, communities from political structures. So I think if we want to look for evidence of precisely this sort of mode of governing indigenous people, it stares us right in the face at the highest level uh, in this instance. But can I just rebut that a little? <laughs> yeah, in this instance, though, um the division between Indigenous services and Crown Indigenous relations is intended to be temporary. It's to have those bands under the Median Act have their Indigenous services administered under that department until they can force them using the money as a carrier or a mm -hmm. stick to sign these new modern agreements, creating a new relationship, severing the old relationship, um, whether it's treaties or Aboriginal title or whatever. Um, and then under those agreements, we'll include service funding. Um, but part of that's going to include only social revenue, which means taxation. And uh, if you're able to negotiate an agreement with the province for some revenue sharing, 
can be met under the cost of delivery programs and services. It's just that the transfer payments will be important. In fact, right now they're talking to the Yukon First Nations um, and the other ones who signed modern treaties to come up with a new funding formula because they've also said our modern treaties are underfunded. We didn't get enough money, you know, to implement uh, the treaty. So they, they have a separate um, funding formula. They want one year to do a baseline to figure out what's a comparable rate of funding that these groups have signed. Modern treaties should get to deliver programs and services under these modern agreements, which is comparable to like uh, uh, White Horse or whatever, you know, the comparable Canadian equivalent is close by to that group that signs the modern treaty or self government agreement. So those agreements are going to include program and service delivery, they're not going to be separate. The only reason why I see them separated apart is most of the bands in the country are under the Indian Act, so they have to move those bands that didn't go to a self government or table or, you know, um, conference and claims table, they want to move them over into these modern agreements along with the ones who did go into a modern treaty uh, and already lined up there, right? Because yeah. you got the James Bay Agreement, you got Mishka, you got the Dene Agreements north of 60, you got uh, the, the Yukon First Nations, you got Tawasin. You know, there's about 30 or 40 groups that have already signed, including the Inuit, um, who've already signed, uh, you know, these modern agreements. The problem is these stubborn bands from Aboriginal title areas in BC or the Atlantic or uh, Quebec or uh, the Prairies were saying, what about our treaties? And they're, and they're including them in these recognition and self-determination tables because they've got these tables set up, about 70 of them are set with First Nations, Métis and Inuit, and they've been using them to feed back into this legislation. But that's where they're going to say, okay, you've still got to sign these agreements if you want to be a federally recognized indigenous government. That's the thing. They're going to define who, what the rights are, how you become a government. It's all federally controlled. So if that legislation passes, you know, it's, it's the only thing I can think of, it's like the constitutional talks in the 80s or when they passed the first Indian Act where we had no say in that in 1876. We're basically looking at it historically. I've never seen in my lifetime anything as massive as what they're proposing right now. And yet we have complete silence almost from our leadership. And uh, the people don't know, so I can understand why they're silent. But we have to wake them up and say, look, this is happening, and you better find out from your chiefs why they're not saying anything. And at the meeting I was at last week, the AFN National <coughs> Forum, I don't think there was one chief from the Atlantic present there. Just point of information. <laughs> But there were a lot of other ones raised in the Thank you very much. I'd like to turn to questions. I just want to make two quick quick statements. One, one is just an observation to come back to the point of impact. I mean, in witnessing this, um, watching um, Jeremy's work as he presents it, and then witnessing how Sherry and Russ can begin to open up whole universes of their own struggles through across their histories. I think that there's something really powerful that what we can do as researchers is turn our research tools on our own institutions and our own processes. And it's something actually that a teacher of mine and a very respected colleague from Canadian Anthropology, Michael Ash, is calling for in his book on being here to stay, is instead of having an anthropology which studies the other, have an anthropology which studies the self and its institutions of power. And, and, and I think that this is a beautiful model of witnessing this today and allowing, first of all, to expose our institutions in this manner and then enter into a fulsome conversation with Indigenous peoples to say, yeah, we've been, we've been experiencing this for decades, for 200 years, in all these multiple forms, bureaucratic forms. <coughs> the other piece I wanted to add was just that in the way that things unfolded, I didn't get a chance to actually tell you about Sherry picked up, um, and I've got a few words here for her. <laughs> Sherry is that uh, Sherry, as I mentioned that she's Mi'kmaq from Ilsa Cook, and she's an assistant professor in the Women's Studies program at, at Mount St. Vincent University. Um, and she has a focus on Indigenous feminism and Indigenous feminisms. Um, her research areas are in decolonization of treaty relations, Indigenous role, uh, Indigenous women's role in food and life ways. I mean, she's been very, very closely in the world uh, program of fisher peoples, um, looking at local fisher peoples, places, but women in particular. 
uh, indigenous refusal politics, indigenous knowledge systems, indigenous food sovereignty, indigenous struggles for social justice, national and national jurisprudence regarding the rights of indigenous women and children. So I, I feel very honored to have both, uh, both Sherry and Russ here for this. And of course, Jeremy making this important impact. Um, so now what I'd like to do is just offer a chance for people uh, here in uh, Halifax to, uh, to ask any questions if they have any. Yes, it's not that. Uh, so what I'd like to do, because we're, because we're live streaming, is I'll take your question, and then I'm going to repeat it. So How do I pro Sure, is, is this on? Yeah, it's on. Okay. So the answer to the answer to the first question, uh, the question was about what is my approach to bureaucracy? How do I understand or theorize what's going on within bureaucracy? In fact, I don't follow Althusser. What I've done in this case is I've taken a theory by the political scientist Tim Mitchell. And Tim Mitchell's argument is that we should we might try to get away from thinking of states as real things, and instead we might think of how do powerful networks come to govern, and how do they extend the influence of that governing network in various ways? And his argument is that if we look at, say for instance, the boundary between assets that are dead versus those that have economic life, we should see that boundary as actually the effect of a network underlying it. Right? That is, the network produces a certain kind of effect that people who govern themselves in the way the network wants to will also find that effect uh, convincing. So for instance, the division between economy and society, the division between public and private, and so on, the difference between different kinds of acceptable versus unacceptable forms of nationalism, etc., uh, gender divisions, and so on. So in, in his account, he calls those effects the metaphysical effect of the state, that is, the myth about the state that a whole bunch of people accept. And so what I argue in my paper when it comes to this sort of theoretical approach is that two things are happening. First, the state doesn't have total control over its own effects, right? because it's constantly being refused by the people that it seeks to govern. So I try to show how the effects of the state are, share, are changed by 
in this case, indigenous actors and indigenous networks who have their own metaphysics. Right? They don't draw the same distinctions between land and water that fit with private property, for instance. So here I'm arguing that we should, that we should first of all, this is in academic articles, you have to critique somebody. So here I'm critiquing Tim Mitchell somewhat, right, to say that he doesn't account for this very well, these bigger systems. And we could argue also that, of course, environmental systems affect the way that states can produce certain kinds of effects. Right? Climate change, for instance, will affect the very borders for many countries, right, by raising sea levels and so forth. Now, uh, so the second question had to do with the way that I understand bureaucracies. And in, did I catch you correctly? You said Michael Hertzfeld? Language yeah, the language games. So Michael Hertzfeld will be very happy to, to know that since I did a lot of work in the anthropology department at Harvard, where he is. Um, but in fact, the way that I think we should understand bureaucracies, and in, in the way that it works in this case, is that they produce certain forms of what we would call social indifference. That is, for instance, if I'm the owner of private property, I get to be indifferent with respect to basically all, a lot of what you might want me to do with my stuff. I might buy a brand new iPhone and slam it on the floor and be indifferent to your need for a phone right at this moment. I can use my private property, that is, in a whole realm of ways that create a certain kind of indifference because we accept certain forms of freedom in those societies about how private property as a social institution fits with private understandings of rights and freedoms versus collective understandings of rights and freedoms. That is, we have a shared agreement about the difference between public and private. So, in this case, and drawn, I think, on, on what Sherry has nicely pointed to, the a private property regime in Canada does not, to land, does not include rights to water. So that boundary creates a certain form of indifference that we all accept that if you're a private property owner to water, unless you have you know, a particular right to waters beyond just domestic use, that is for industrial or agricultural uses, you have to go and get a different type of right to them, and it varies across the country based on what sort of land claim you have, if it's close to a river for riparian access. Uh, if the province of Quebec, for instance, has a law that says that nobody can own the water, it has to be a commons, right? unless you happen to put it in really, really tiny little bottles and you can sell it, that seems to be a small exception. Um, but but in, in all cases, a private property system produces a certain form of indifference. And in this case, that form of indifference is very violent. It's very patriarchal, and it specifically affects indigenous women in this case, and their responsibilities to relationships with water. And, then, and not just water alone, of course, but water in relation to a whole set of other concerns around land, around kinship, and so forth. So I think when we talk about indifference, this is not a language game. And I think there's a very nice paper from Eve Tuck that says decolonization is not a metaphor. It involves actual return of material land and the relations that would come along with authority over that land. So I think here I would push back to say this is not about language. And this is about relations. Yes, I'm going to bring my phone so that you can hear me. Hey, my name's Jeremy. Um, my question is overall for Canada. Um, where they're doing the Private Property Act, Trudeau has promised our people that they're going to clean the waters in Canada for our reserves. So when we privatize this land, does that mean that we're in charge of cleaning our own water? or the insurer is still cleaning our waters to... Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Do you mean like clean dirty water? Yeah. Because we have so many, we have so many communities across Canada that doesn't have clean drinking waters, but yet you want to privatize our land. Does that mean it's our responsibility now to clean our waters since we don't have clean water now? This is one of the questions that I think lies at the heart. So this agenda is not being presented yet in the legislature, right, this, this potential legislation. But I think the type of concern that you're raising is precisely what's at issue. As I mentioned, the, the proposal underneath this legislation would remove all previous sections and obligations under land administration in the Indian Act. So the, the way that reserve land would function would be like, 
the analogy with the other municipalities. So, for instance, in the maritime region, there are pilot projects to create indigenous water utilities that would be responsible for, for providing uh, water on reserve, right? So how that would function exactly across all different First Nations in Canada is not the sort of thing I think that I would be comfortable trying to predict, because I think that's going to be something that's contested and will be a lot of negotiation, particularly in the, in the types of service arrangements and different forms of funding, different kinds of incentives to get uh, agreement to opt in to different forms of legislation or into new sorts of uh, modern treaties or whatever the new rights and, uh, rights and recognition framework calls uh, its, things in, its agreements in the end. So I think here, this is precisely the sort of issue that's at stake, right? is that the, the attempt to uh, render these ongoing structural forms of injustice as simple historical mistakes, oh, oops, we didn't recognize property in the past, now we can just fix it, right? tells a very neat and tidy story about something that just happened in the past, and we can, if we fix that, a whole bunch of things will fall into place. When actually, the ongoing fact of settler colonialism is that a it's a structure that continues to shape relations in the, in the present. It's not something that's historical, it's, some, it's, an it's not an event, right? it's something that continues to shape things. So that would be, that would be not a full answer, I guess, to your question precisely how it happened, but I think this is where a lot of the struggles would lie, is how do you negotiate these particular differences and contests that you identify? I, I would just add, what you need to look at is what's happening with the Nishka. You know, they had collective rights, but now they've gone into private ownership of former reserve lands. And, um, for example, uh, if you don't pay your taxes, your lands can be sold off at public auction to other nishkas. They can't just sell it to anybody, but other nishkas can purchase land that's up for sale in these land auctions. And uh, the other thing to look at is that Tawasa. I know this one lady, Bertha Williams, uh, Arthur, was her, actually she's on YouTube if you look up Bertha Williams. She had um, a certificate of possession under the Indian Act, which is as close to private property as you can get on reserve. And uh, she talked about how she lost her property rights under this Tawasin uh, Treaty and uh, how the new Tawasin First Nation government under that modern treaty could take her lands. And she was talking about what was happening to her. So I think what you have to look at is how are these modern treaties being implemented in terms of private property? What happens? You know, what is the, uh, the so-called government responsible for? And what are you as an individual responsible for on your your own private lands? Uh, so what I'm saying is there's existing examples where you can look at um, these modern agreements, how it's affecting individuals who are members of those communities that have signed on to them. Um, and there's still new forms that are going to be coming. But basically it is the feds offloading their responsibility yes. through different uh, techniques. And um, that's their whole objective is to get out of the Indian business. And Carolyn Bennett was was uh, pretty clear on that that they don't want to have to do this anymore. Um, so that's what this new Indigenous Rights Framework is going to be about. It's self determination. You're on your own, even though you're not getting your land back. Uh, <laughs> deal with it on reserve. All right. Is there anything else? Um, so, my question is about, more about the Indigenous Rights uh, Framework that the government is trying to pass in December, and, and what that means for Indigenous nations across Canada. And so, does that mean that it, does that terminate, if that passes, does that terminate our hunting and fishing rights, as well as implement this property of protections act just all across the board, like what will that look like if it is passed? And also, second question, is about mobilizing resistance and what can we do? Okay. What, what uh, the Trudeau government has said, what the uh, Crown Indigenous Relations Minister has also said is they're going to um, replace the, the inherent right to self-government and comprehensive claims policies with a new approach in this uh, framework. Um, they're saying the 
character, we don't know what's going to be in the legislation because we haven't seen the language of the bill. What we do know is they have an overview document which is available online, which they released last week, which sets up, based on their engagement, 89 engagement sessions, which are selective engagements. They don't call it consultation. They say they've had uh, 89 uh, engagements with, I don't know, a thousand and some people. But um, through the 70 rights and self-determination tables, uh, Joe Wild has said they're, they're talking to, to um, First Nations governments representing about 800,000 Indigenous peoples in Canada. That's what they're saying. So they're throwing these numbers, these statistics around. And um, <clears throat> the, uh, the overview document is the clearest thing we have about what they propose to be in the, in the legislation. So there's some, I guess the easy answer is <clears throat> if it involves off-reserve lands, hunting and fishing involves off-reserve lands with the provinces, uh, it means you're going to have to have agreement with the provinces. I mean, that's what's happening under um, these modern treaties, comprehensive claims right now. <coughs> it's basically what it seems to me is they're taking the comprehensive claims and self-government policy. They say they're replacing it, but really what it seems to me they're doing is they're elevating it from policy, interpreting their, their negotiating positions and interpreting Aboriginal treaty rights under Section 35. They're going to elevate that into legislation. Um, you know, they're going to interpret our constitutional rights in this legislation, this framework. And uh, one thing we do know, they say that the provinces have to be involved in anything that touches their area of jurisdiction. So we do know that under the existing tables, and they, and they provide for the existing tables, because you have an nego existing negotiating table in Nova Scotia with the treaties. You have one in New Brunswick. They're also, I think, mentioned in this uh, rights recognition framework that they're at those tables. But they do say in there that there's, they're going to bridge what I call the termination tables, which are the self-government and comprehensive claims tables. They say they're going to bridge them into this framework. In other words, they're going to bring them in. And, uh, you know, because it's going to be one law across Canada for all First Nations, Métis, and Inuit. And they're going to create institutions. One's an oversight body, another one's a dispute resolution body. So you're going to have one window for everybody for all Indigenous peoples uh, going through there. And if you have a dispute over negotiations, you're going to go to that, that dispute resolution body. And they're saying it'll be voluntary for provinces if they want to be part of it or not. So that's what they're saying in this overview document. We don't actually see the wording of the legislation. What the overview document is telling us, it's an outline of what's likely to be in the legislation when it's introduced. Um, but we don't have the actual word. We won't see that until they introduce it into Parliament in December. But I think we've seen enough in there that it's a threat that we should say, hey, stop what you're doing, go back to the drawing board, and start with our communities. Because we have had no say in any of this stuff you've done so far. For three years. They've had three years to talk to us. They talked to AFN. They talked to certain select chiefs and organizations, not the people. And who have the rights? Even under Canadian law, the rights holders are the people. And who has the right to self-determination? The people. Article 18 of the UN Declaration says, Indigenous peoples have the right to decision-making through their own Indigenous institutions. Well, bands and band councils are not Indigenous institutions. But that's what they're using. Chief and councils and band council resolutions. We have to, if we really want to see the UN international standards like in the Declaration apply, we have to start meeting outside of the band council forums and band office forums as indigenous peoples and start making our own decisions heard through some kind of declaration or documentation and forward them. So it's part of mobilization. We have to start signing on to declarations or something saying we're opposed and networking. We have social media where we can network and use it to activate. We didn't have that in previous generations. You know, I'm old enough to remember teletypes. <laughs> you know, and fax machines, but we're past that now, you know, we have social media and we can communicate and we can activate through those communications and network, and that's what we need to do more of, but we need to be informed, we need to know what's in there, and right now the clearest information we have is in that overview document because they've been secretive, yeah. they govern by secrecy and deceit, and when I say deceit, I mean public relations, communication strategies, 
where they manipulate our words like nation to nation and reconciliation. That's why so many of our people are confused because they think Trudeau is being nice to us. <laughs> yeah, I, just to follow up on what Russ has said, I did a policy brief on the Yellowhead Institute. And if you look at the, at the you'll see a policy brief just based on uh, what Russ has said, what had happened here in Nova Scotia since the I Don't Know More movement. That was started by women, by the way. Um, yep. Since the I Don't Know More movement, um, there was a, the, the negotiation uh, process here in Nova Scotia was called into question. And because, well, it's a long assorted story, but we were listed there that the Nova Scotia process that the chiefs um, and the legal team would insist was not like a land claims negotiation, but yet there we were posted on the Indigenous Aboriginal Indian Affairs, as I've known it, website as a comprehensive land claim. So this has been a touchy area of trying to change that, ch change that language. And so our friend Joe Wilde provided a letter and said that this was sort of a unique process and so forth, but with the help of Sherry Pasternak, we concluded that now we are part of this new rights framework agreement. Uh, and so, anyways, just look at the, the policy brief. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty scary stuff. And uh, um, what, I've, what I've learned, and based on my research, that the way the federal government uh, reviews the duty to consult, it stopped at the chief and council. And this was the issue with Alton Gas. This was the issue where... The, the, you know, it was just assumed that the chief for, could speak for the people, and the people found out, well, we haven't been informed. And that's where the issue is going to be, is that the, uh, we as peoples, not as the elected chief and council, do we have a right to be informed? And I would say we have, we have a right. And just as uh, Russ says, I'm not sure if we are by engaging, which is so weird, with our own leadership is the right answer at this point because they're locked into this new legislative framework. And I think it's, it's, it's just going to have to take mobilization of, uh, uh, how do you say it, the rights, the right holders. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. That, I mean, yeah. you know, as I listen to it, whether it's <laughs> what Sherry and Russ are describing or what, what Jeremy has described, it's very, very difficult to, to see anything that, that has the shape of a nation-to-nation -nation relationship, has the shape of those peace and friendship treaties that were signed in the 1700s, right, where there were two peoples, two sovereigns that met and agreed uh, and brought their, as in two political societies who were speaking to one another. This sounds like one political society saying we're going to establish you as an institutional form of governance within our political society, right? Like municipalities, but we'll call them indigenous, indigenous governance models. And the, um, we're getting very close to uh, 9.30. Um, uh, I have another question I wanted to ask, but if, is there anybody else here who would like to ask a, a question of any of the, any of the panelists? Um, just quickly, I just, it's not really a comment, just thank you to each and every one of you for your contribution. Um, I just, I wanted to pick up a little bit, uh, Jeremy, on what you said about um, live and dead um, and the link with the market and that what's in the market is alive and what's not in the market is dead. And I wanted to link it back to uh, what Sharon was talking about with the murder of Indigenous women. And everything that has been laid out here by all of you is the violence of liberal capitalism. Mm -hmm. And that logic of the market is life and everything outside the market is death is literally killing us. Um, and so, I just felt that I needed to sort of underscore that, to talk about myth busting, that whole narrative of the market is life and everything outside the market is death, is precisely 
when the violence is, that logic is murderous. It's genocidal. It's killing indigenous people at exponential rates. It's also killing all of us and life on this planet. Um, so thank you to each of you for helping us understand that. Anybody want to say anything? I, I think I'll just hold my question. Can I just say something? Yeah. One question, one statement. Nobody can own the earth, nobody can own mother earth, and nobody can buy it and sell it. Because who you buy it from, who's selling it? You know, you can't, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that. There's spirit in the earth, there's spirit in the water, the same spirit that's within all of us. So, um, thank you. This, this has been great. I worked all day and I got school tomorrow and stuff, and I'm like, I'm gonna go. I'm like, he's like, yeah, let's go. And I'm like, definitely gonna be there to support you guys. So. I'm glad I was here to listen to this all because I had no idea, and I'm sure we're going to all get together and see what we can do to mobilize, but um, uh, or do what we can to stop this. Um, well, actually, we will, because we don't know that. So what can we do, um, everybody in here, like, to stop this? Is there anything that you guys want to recommend that we can do to stop this? Like, I don't, like besides the regular stuff that we'll do on social media to connect and, like, boots on the ground, grassroots, but, like, anything like that, Regular people, you know, does everybody can do like email, call, or read a document, or any words that we can, you know, that kind of thing. I, I would say teaching. You should have maybe a teaching around here okay. to start educating um, the indigenous and non-indigenous peoples because we need Canadian and allies support because um, we're going to need a lot of effort to stop this legislation. That means we're going to need Canadians to help us too to say that you know. The Trudeau government, just like the Trans Mountain courtroom, <laughs> said they didn't properly consult. Well, they didn't properly consult us on this legislation. They completely bypassed us. So, what we're going to do, uh, our network is going to do, is hold a webinar uh, within the next couple of weeks. I think uh, maybe the first week or so in October. And we want to see some teachings. And we're organizing some materials to hand out information sheets and that which can be sent across on social media. But the first thing we want to do is create the awareness and education and then mobilize. But first we want people to be aware of what it is, what the threat is, and then uh, what we need to do to stop it. Um, so kind of two steps. Uh, so the first step right now I think we're at is making people aware because most people don't know about this. You know, the government has kept us under wraps. The, the clearest thing we have now is this overview document about 13 pages. That? It's online. If you go to the, uh, if you go for national engagement recognition framework, if you Google that in, right with the page you'll come up to it, it says overview document right there at the top. And you can download it. It's a PDF. And uh, in there it describes what might be contained in the legislation. And that's what we talked about last week at this national forum that a number of chiefs were critical of because that's the first time they saw it too. It was just released last week. There was a previous version released in July, which um, I don't have the link on me, but you know our networks did uh, a statement and um, a breakdown of that engagement document where we started taking apart the proposed legislation, which is in that. That was from July. So this one that I'm referring to replaces that one in July. It doesn't change the framework, it just adds more details, which are scarier. They could start saying, you know, yes, you can have this um, recognition committee. You know, you appear before this recognition committee. If you pass, you can be an indigenous government, and then your government will be authorized to have the same powers of a natural person. You know, they start to lay out the details. And then the list of powers you can have, which we're going to pass, there'll be definitions. So that's laid out in there. The, the details are coming out more of what's going to be in the legislation. But we're... We just found this out last week. We've seen the framework. We knew it was a problem. Now we're seeing more details to the framework. They're adding flesh to the bones. And the more they add, the more we're saying, stop this, go back to the drawing board. We shouldn't have to wait to see the actual wording in the bill in you know, the second week of December or whatever. We need to stop it now. So we need to organize in what's left of September and October. And maybe
maybe if we have to mobilize in November and December, then we'll have to do that. Thank you very much. Okay, I think I'm going to hold off on my question. If people do have questions for any of our panelists, you know, they they can come and ask them afterwards. But um, I just wanted to thank all three of them. I wanted to uh, thank Jeremy. Um, one of the things that I remember writing in my uh, in my recommendation letter for him to receive the Impact Award is that he's actually one of the most genuine, kind, uh, committed, reliable researchers I've ever met, and, and very humble. And I, I, I just want to say, you know, honor you, Jeremy, for the work you've done, and realize that this this whole thing about impact, I think it's being spoken about at the end of the end of a session like this when people say, well, what can we do, what can we do at the grassroots? And I think that. <laughs> Jer right. Jeremy, uh, Jeremy, uh, in saying regulatory gaps, he's helped us understand what Perry Belgrin means when he says closing the gap. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I also want to thank Russ Saibo and, uh, and Dr. Sherry Pinto for these amazing contributions in this great dialogue. And all of you for joining us uh, in this conversation, and we'll keep it going, right? It's so good to you. see you. Thank you very much.